Welcome back, everybody. I'm Sean LaFlock. I'm here with Scotty Hagnes. This is Conversations, Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity. Scott, man, looking picturesque there yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, a little different location last week. Same place, still in Palm Springs. Looking last awesome, Last full man. day here. We travel back tomorrow, then I have a few, uh, few staycation days on the other end. So. Nice. Are you one of those people who, like, when they get back from, like, a vacation, they give themselves a day just to kind of reacclimate themselves? Do you dive back in? Uh, well, usually... Depends. I mean, ideally, yeah, a day. This time I'm going to have four, four and a half days. Yep. Because um, I wanted a full two weeks. And I will actually work a little. I don't have any of my normal. I'm not going to see clients, teach classes, or yep. even write programs. But some back-end stuff, get through some reading that I've been wanting to do that I didn't get done down here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, man. I mean, why read when you can just stuff. be out there, man? Out there yeah. living it. Yeah, yep. I heard uh, yeah. you, you had spoke about uh, Joshua tree earlier. Is it just a tree? What What is it? <laughs> well, it's it's the Mojave Desert, uh-huh. and the trees are certainly unique. They look like kind of odd palm trees that look more like little scrubby evergreen trees. Yep. It's, yeah, it's super interesting. And there's other cactuses and different things out there, too, some junipers. But, um, yeah, quite a landscape. I mean, it's like you can see it being a sci-fi movie as another planet, you know, with these kind of odd trees and a lot of you know round granite rocks. There's some rock climbing out there. Uh-huh. We hiked to an old an old uh, a gold mine from the turn of the century. It's wow, still fairly intact. Um, about three and maybe two miles in, and then did like a four mile continuation loop. And so that was that was pretty neat to see because uh, most people don't know this about me, but my original um, schooling and what I was going to be as a uh, adult human out of high school and early college was a mining engineer. So, wow! So you have like yeah, a, a so. little bit of a background <laughs> passion when it comes to spelunking, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So those things are always super interesting to me. Oh, that's very cool, so, uh, man! Yeah. Um, I didn't even know that was out there. So. Oh wow! Though sometimes some things find you, right? Yeah. Um, so I I uh, have something to kind of pose to you. So there was a. Uh, 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 training protocol that I had uh, come across the other day and maybe we can dissect this a little bit and kind of see where the thought behind this might be because it comes from a very reputable place. There is a build-up interval where you start off on, let's say it's uh, of your max wattage, let's say you start off at about 70% and then you build it up to 80% after 30 seconds and then another 30 seconds building up to 90%. So it's a 90 second interval and then let's say a 30 second rest between intervals and you'll do that for multiple intervals. Let's say it's like four to six or something like that or all the Mm -hmm. way up to even let's say 10. Could you think of anything that might be beneficial for doing build up intervals where it's not necessarily starting at a slow pace, kind of like that moderate to tough and then building progressively from there? Yeah. um, I I, I feel like I've done you know, less structured ramp ups or heard of them, but that definitely does sound like a little different than anything I've personally tried or had anyone do. Um, I am assuming that the goal of this is sort of a high end aerobic power. Okay. So I guess we can, we can just talk, we could think about that first. So high end aerobic power. Okay. So how would building the interval, allow you for better power output why not just do 30 seconds on 30 seconds off uh, and obviously in the context of the sport Mm -hmm. yeah well i feel like um so as we know all energy systems are always active Mm -hmm. but with Mm -hmm. um so taking your typical 30 on 30 off sustainable like i think we've all done for a number of years. Yep. Uh, it's possible, you know, of course, that you're getting a little bit of an over contribution of some of the systems you don't necessarily uh, use right out of the gate, possibly, as we go from either very easy spinning or paddling or perhaps just 30 seconds pure uh, passive rest. And then we get on and go. And then uh, with the build, by the time you hit the, the hardest 30 seconds, it would seem to me that your uh, aerobic system is already, you know, vastly predominantly active at that point so you actually maybe get a better training effect Uh Uh, we now know that even you know uh, short efforts are predominantly aerobic even things like 400 meter running at all out paces which you would assume would be a very glycolytic activity is actually yeah significantly aerobic so that that would be my thought around why that might be really beneficial or more beneficial perhaps uh, than a standard 30-30, and especially so if you're dealing with a 
fast twitch neuromuscularly efficient athlete wow 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 what a crazy way to think about it but that 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 sounds very logical when you explain it there scott so it's a good thing i brought this up um yeah that makes sense because it's almost like uh, let, let's say for instance how uh, you might do a heavy set of back squat and then you might do some you know lunge jumps or you know some vertical leap stuff you're kind of maybe pre-fatiguing some stuff and then getting some deeper muscle fiber kind of uh, um, uh, activation in the same way. Because if you try to do a 90-second interval and you're going so hard out the gate that you basically drop off, you're never going to be able to actually hold those higher percentages. So by default, those first 30-second, 60-second portions have to be sustainable in order for you to actually do part three of that interval. And it also makes sense that it's only a 30 second rest because it's almost like that first minute of that interval wasn't even a challenge to your current aerobic system that you'd be able to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Wow. 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 Hmm. I'm intrigued. I might have to actually give this a shot um, on the assault bike and maybe uh, report back a little bit and see how it feels um, relative to things like 30-30s or minute on, minute off. Because I have been doing, um, I I started doing uh, my second phase of my three-minute build-ups to greatness, so to speak. I've been trying to do a 10-minute assault bike, and I'm trying to get as close to 200 cals per hour as I, or uh, 200 cals uh, in 10 minutes. And I've been doing my first block of training. I did a build-up in terms of volume, three minutes on, three minutes rest. Now this second block after a deload, I'm doing three minutes on 90 seconds rest um, to try and build endurance a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And my opposite, like I was doing one workout like that, so three minutes on, three minutes off for multiples. But my other interval was one minute on, 20 seconds off for multiple sets Mm -hmm. and then multiple Mm -hmm. series of those. So I think I might give that a try of the buildups, like 30, 30, 30, rest 30 and do that for multiples and see what that might look like based upon, well, if it's a 90-second interval and we're, we're trying to build power, um, what would you anticipate that would be a... Well, I guess... Go ahead. Well, I guess here's a question that yep. uh, I didn't uh, clarify beforehand. Is So we have these three percentages of wattage. Is this a what is percentage that of? of absolute max? Yeah. Maximum you can generate it just for a moment. Is it like the maximum power output in an all out 30 second test or how do we yeah, determine? I, I think is? it was probably determined through a 30 minute, 30 minute test, I imagine. And then percentages off of that. But that being said, like say you're holding, I think the, the maximum wattage for this particular individual was 72, or excuse me, uh, not wattage, uh, 70 uh, RPM, 72 RPMs, RPMs on an assault right. bike. So if you're thinking 72 RPMs on an assault bike, you're like, all right, I, I think that's challenging for 30 seconds, but not something that's going to kill me. But if I mm-hmm. proceeded mm-hmm. that with, with 30 seconds of 64, 30 seconds of 67, and then I went to that 72, that might be a little bit more, more challenging. You know, and I, and I think it's probably, I mean, obviously when you get to a certain point, it really doesn't matter what you're necessarily trying to develop. Are you trying to develop your 10 minute, your 30 minute? I mean, you need a little bit of everything because, you know, say you're in a chipper where you start off with a thousand meter row that has, that's for time. And then you go into something else. That's a piece like, you know, you really can't plan for that. So in some ways, having some kind of randomization of your, or, or not randomization, but all encompassing areas of your training, especially more toward, uh, sport training. I think it's probably important to kind of integrate some of those things, but I I would imagine that really wouldn't help you with a 30 minute, like, uh, like test going that short for like 90 second intervals. I don't know. What do you think? Or maybe this is to just build uh, if, just power in general. It would be sustainable yeah, power. I would, I, I would, I would think that it would help with sustainable power. And yeah. if you were more interested in improving a thirty-minute test, you know, probably volume would be needed uh, uh, more so uh, relative, you know, to, to what you're able to recover from. And, and I, it's hard to say how taxing that would be without giving it a try. I'd, I'd be curious once I get back. Uh, Give yeah, it give a, it a shot. A I'm too. definitely going to give it yeah. a whirl. I think tomorrow morning I'll give it a shot, and then I'll probably do it again the following week. So I'll give you a couple of uh, 
insights and uh, I'll probably start off conservatively and then ramp up from there. But just kind of thinking about that, how, um, you know, you explained it of, of the idea of going into a, almost like a flying start, mm-hmm. you know, you can consider it like that. Like you're going to run 200 meters and then you're going to go harder for a hundred meters. So 200 meters at a building pace and then bang, you're going to hit that hundred meter mark and you're going to go faster. Um, like you said, by, by, by kind of pre fatiguing or at least setting the mental barometer, you can then say this hundred meters is going to be a little bit more challenging, but it is, it can be fairly more aerobic energy system dominant. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you try it too, Scott, obviously make a, make a note and trying to, you know, maybe we'll, we'll share each other's findings on this one. Yeah. I'll give it a try. And I don't have a, I haven't done any aerodyne work for a while and I haven't done any cycling cycling mm. since September. I've been you know, doing basically just you know, BMX for my conditioning and then those 20 rep sets for the high end stuff because you get sucking away pretty good off multiples yep. of those, especially with relatively short rest. So what you're um, trying to say is this assault bike workout is probably going to feel awesome for you. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, yeah. I think it'll feel awesome. But uh, having spent lots of lots of time on that thing in, yeah. in past years, I'll uh, definitely take be able to come here. And, and actually, yeah, I, I would, from the things I've done, like my you know, conditioning does seem to be really still pretty good from mm-hmm. those two, two ends of the spectrum. Yep. An interesting just side note on that, well, um, if I – do those 20 rep workouts. I just do a standard warm up and I do them as a standalone. They typically, especially now that I'm lifting ever heavier on those sets, uh, they feel rather lactic, you know, they almost feel uh-huh. like chipper or, you know, that not, not un, you know, CrossFit esque feeling at times yeah. to them. However, on other days, because I've been really, we had good weather and I was really working on this video project, riding takes total precedence. I would sometimes ride for hour, hour and a half Mm -hmm. aerobic rates. And then I would just come back because it's only a few minute drive back to the gym and just go straight into those 20 rep workouts, which I knew wasn't optimal. But that's the only way it was going to happen. And those days, I wouldn't feel that lack at all. And I I would still improve. So that that long aerobic uh, system being active um, coming in, even though I was maybe a little tired, um, it felt so much different, a whole different feeling. So what, what's your thoughts? What, what, I mean, obviously we, we can speculate a little yeah, bit, I mean, but what do you think? Is it more, I think neuro- I'm not terribly surprised. Neuromuscular think, is it more energy system wise? Like you're priming. I think the... it's having the aerobic system is fully active. And, mm-hmm. and I know that, uh, you know, when I, when I was doing, uh, competitive wads, you know, I would do 30 minute minimum aerobic warm ups before I would do them in the last year, year and a half that I was doing that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, totally changed the feeling of those workouts yeah so really and some people take a long time to get the aerobic system active, especially those that kind of would default more to an anaerobic process yeah so, yeah that's a good point so yeah i've just 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 surprised the difference in feeling first few times i thought it was a bit of an outlier but after i saw the pattern repeated and yep. you know as i would you know mix between them it wasn't just that i was better conditioned to the the one you know the the workouts because then when a day came and I didn't ride first. Oh, nope. There it is. Yeah. It was very, very consistent. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So we'll have to kind of look more into that as we, uh, as you get back into training and as I kind of tinker around with this a little bit, but it's funny actually, because I got off my deload and then got back on the assault bike with a little bit different intervals. I kind of, you know, swallowed my pride a little bit and was like, you know what, I'm going to be conservative here. I'm not going to go crazy. I'm I mean, I, I was finishing off the three, three minute on three minute off at like uh, race pace, 10 minute race pace. I, uh, I took, I think almost 10 or 12 days, like without going really intense. And then when I got back mm-hmm. on, I was like, all right, I'm going to go three minutes on 90 seconds off and do that for four sets, obviously backing it off a little bit. But that first set, just getting back on there was like, oh my God, I've never assault bike before. I mean, it was painful. Oh, man. Wow. It was painful. It didn't help that like the yeah. temperature dropped by like 20 degrees. So you get the snot in the <sighs> going, no. but you know, it, 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 like I've never really integrated too much, like strict, like don't do anything during my deloads. Cause I'm always kind of doing shit. Mm-hmm. So to actually have a deload and then get back into it, um, it, it's a bit rough that first week. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm looking for 
looking forward to that too. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm going to get sore from this stuff again. <laughs> yeah. But you know what though? I think, um, the second week is when you start to feel it. Like I had, um, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually programming it for, uh, some athletes who are going to be peaking for Wadapalooza and their, um, assessment coming back in. And this is, um, you know, purely the athletes that I've, I've worked with is that the first couple days is, is rough. They're, a little bit mentally, like I'm not stronger now. Why, I, I just took time off. I should be killing it right now. But in some ways, if you were killing it, you'd be really, really bad. Like you would have been so far off the edge that not working out got you better. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. not that it allow it, it's not that the deload gets you better. It allows you to then go hard again. Mm-hmm. It re- think, it re- recharges just, the battery so that you can hit it hard. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not getting you better. It's not a realization. I think that's what peaking is, right? Peaking is realization. Mm-hmm. Realization mode. Deload yeah. is allowing you to get back into intensification. So you kind of mm-hmm. reset the circuit breakers, you get after it, and now you start to build again. And then when it's time to peak, that is more of, okay, the intensity is going to be high. The volume is going to be relatively low so that you can get the, the benefits of the deload in terms of the restoration of your body, but you also get almost more mentally and physically acute to prepare yourself for competition. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yep. And the difference is that, you know, in the, the realization or paper, you have to have those elements in there, uh, but uh, exactly as you said, and then that prepares you for optimal performance, but a, a full deload or recovery break, you know, you're intentionally letting a bit of fitness slip, but knowing that you're coming back with recharged batteries, you'll yeah. quickly get back to where you were and then surge beyond them. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you could do it a couple of ways. You can do like that taper where you're, you're keeping the intensity high, but the volume drops down or what you can do. And I've, I've done this and we've done this before is like almost take your deload week the prior week. And obviously it depends upon the person and many different factors, but doing this objectively prior to it, so you take your deload week, the prior week prior, not, not the week of competition, but the week prior, and then you kind of get back into training so that you shake the rust off and then you hit the competition the following weekend because you've already gotten through the shaking off rust phase. You've gotten the benefits of resetting the circuit breakers and now you're ready to hit it again. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yep, that's a, yeah, that totally works in some cases and yeah, yeah others they fall flat on their face. <laughs> yeah there's so many it's so individual you know yeah and, and i think uh it's important to actually get that uh in training and, and kind of see and and why off-season competitions are actually important so that you're maximizing uh the performance when it counts um and you can kind of tinker around with those things outside of training or outside yeah, of testing yeah. or, or competition yeah yeah, yeah you have to uh have to practice for it yeah, very intriguing. But yeah. uh, I, th- I thought I'd share that with you because, you know, obviously there's some uh, things that I've never tried before that are finally actually sucking it up and, and doing because I'm uh, kind of letting go of the attachment to training more and more. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, I'm excited to try that. Thanks for sharing that, uh, that protocol. And Absolutely, dude. Um, yeah. So the, the other thing I want to talk a little bit about, and this is kind of like the paradigm shift of health and wellness in, in, in general, and I'd love to get your perspective on this, is um, I, I heard something staggering the other day. We both know Chris Cresser, obviously, right? Chris Cresser, he's mm-hmm. a yep. um, you know, functional medicine practitioner, um, very well-known, or more well-known now because of uh, guys like Rob Wolf, and obviously, you know, here it's a stone's throw away from, from people like you. But he, he gave out a staggering statistic that said 100 million Americans are now either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Yeah, yeah. And, and that the health care costs in the next 22 years will double because of preventable disease and, and can, can chronic disease. So say we spend, I don't know, $6 trillion on health care, it's going to go up to $12 trillion in health care in the next 22 years because of a couple things. One, the fact that longevity is, you know, lifespan is not going to shorten because of chronic disease. We just are so good now. We have, we allow people to survive longer while being sick. Yeah. 
Uh, and mm -hmm. then the other thing is that uh, it is uh, a chronic disease, so people people live with it and they need to tr be treated by it. So the average healthcare mm -hmm. cost of a diabetic is fourteen thousand dollars a year. When you times that by one hundred million people, that cost goes up very very quick. Sure. Yeah. So here's my question to you: What is the role of the fitness practitioner? Um, in the next, in the short term, and then maybe even the long term. What are your thoughts? Wow. Yeah. I, mean, I know I blew your hair <laughs> it's off. It's pretty staggering. Statistic. Yeah. That's, whew, don't have to <laughs> shave now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I knew it was up there. I hadn't heard that exact one, but it's, yeah, it's pretty epic. You know, well, it's obviously, um, we need to figure a way to be better about reaching our, uh, some of those folks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we work with um, uh, a certain number of folks, but it's obviously just a drop in the bucket of how, how, what's needed, you know? And, yeah. and probably at the end of the day, there's a handful of uh, person types of people that we collect, but there's a whole bunch of other types that we probably have zero effect over because they're not ready to hear. They don't want to, you know, make any changes. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, do you I suppose think... that the, um, the figuring a way to make it easy to uh, simply get started with, you know, lifestyle and yep. healthy changes as a for those folks? But I'm not sure what the answer is. Do you think this is more of an individual problem or more of a system problem? I mean, obviously, uh, there's there's shades of everything. Uh, this isn't yeah. a uh, this isn't a, a battle of who this really is. But what do you think? What are your thoughts? Right. Yeah. yeah. I. I mean. I think we like to to blame the individual, and obviously there is some there, but I think it's a just a it's just a um, product of our society and the way we live our life in this um, in the you know twenty first century in the industrial technological world. You know, large amounts of sitting, a large amount of work scheduled. Uh, no time to, you know, or no people don't consider like that's important or if they do it's usually just eat less um and then they of course binge and hit the other cycle you know either people overdo it or underdo it it seems like there's little in the middle yep and uh, that's where you know that's where uh, i think <laughs> the health yeah. health and well-being lies yep um and there's most voices you hear are kind of Tan toward the the opposite end, you know. The... It's a very good point. It's a very good point. Like um, when you have a person who's sedentary, and you're looking at a fitness guru, say like you can do it and that kind of stuff. That person isn't going to be thinking that they're talking to them. No, you know what I'm saying. So you you're. I think you have something profound there in that you can only think so far outside of you who you currently are before mm -hmm. that message cause, kind of doesn't resonate with you anymore. And I'll give you another for instance. Like if I sit yeah. on Instagram and I talk about the intricacies of triplanar uh, respiratory effects in posture and squat capabilities, and you just looked on, you just started doing CrossFit, I'm not speaking to you. But if right. you have somebody who, does, who says, all right, you're going to get your band, you're going to put it around your hips, and you're going to sit down in a squat position for 10 minutes, let's go. Like, um, that is much more appealing to you. Now, is, mm -hmm. is one person, is, is that person correct? N not uh, entirely. That's not going to fix your problem, but at least gets you out of where you currently are. So mm -hmm. I've sh thrown a lot of shade and a lot of, a lot of hate toward people who are just don't give the right answers. But in a lot of ways, they're so freaking important. They're so important because eventually people will start being more and more aware and have to seek more answers. Now, is every going to be buddy going to be like that? No, but I don't want to work with everybody. Right. You know, and I think you yeah. feel the same way. Like you only work mm -hmm. what 20 athletes at any given time. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, you, so many, you can really, yeah, you can't help everybody. Now, now I think if, like there's 88 keys on a keyboard. If we all play our note, we can make some beautiful music, but if everybody says, I want to be the catch-all, you're not going to actually be able to help anybody because nobody's actually going to be receiving your message. 
You know, right. one day, one day, scattered them all over the place. Exactly. One day you're speaking on a level of the introductory person. The next day you're speaking to a handful of, of physical therapists that have any clue with what you're talking about. The, mm-hmm. the magic is the person who can explain like I'm five, but then also sit down with those 12 people who are the only ones who know what you're talking about and be able to like pick apart what's going on. And I think that's why you see so many of these um, amazing minds, people like Chris Cresser in particular, who can get on a podcast and actually, in my mind, really speak to basic individuals who say, I'm screwed, I, have, I can't help myself, and actually get them outside of it a little bit, but then also mm-hmm. speak to a person like me and even above me, because I'm not, you know, some of the shit is completely above my head, and connect with me as well. So they're giving on multiple levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you have to know where your, your main message is, but be able to go either direction outside. And know that. who your audience is in that particular setting. So again, like who are you talking to on Instagram? Are you talking to like fit, like like real healthcare practitioners? Like probably not. You're 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 talking to somebody who who crossfits five days a week for an hour, who's a weekend warrior. And, you know, by, by talking, and again, I'm talking to myself here by, mm-hmm. <laughs> by doing like very complex things, don't be shocked that not everybody gets it. So you have to be almost more, more, uh, not dumbed down, but more, uh, general for people to kind of buy in a little bit. And then you can increase the complexity as people learn over time. So kind of taking that mm-hmm. idea, we need, we, we do need people to say like, just eat regular, just eat real food. Whereas we're like, dude, we've been eating food, real food for tons, you know, years. We work with people every day where it's like not about real food. It's about, you know, macros and it's about, you know, um, you know, staying away from sensitive foods. When a person who is sitting on their couch doesn't exercise and thinks Chipotle is health food, you've got to give them information that allows them to take a small step forward. Because there was something actually I was thinking about today is the reason why change isn't very easy for me in particular or anybody in particular is because we see it on a grand scale, that mountain effect. I see the change as I'm going to have to do this for 60 years, whereas Mm. the change isn't for 60 years. The change is just for the next moment and this moment and this moment. And that that adage of one day at a time reigns true. If you do break it down like just today, I'm not going to eat or I am going to eat this or I'm going to exercise just today. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and decide if I want to continue to do it. That becomes a lot more digestible, no pun intended, mm-hmm. Yeah. to get to more people to kind of change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. You know, you, you think like, never again, or oh, I always now have to. And, you know, it's really... Yeah, no, that's, that's not real. Yeah. Like, oh, I live in the real yeah. world. We're going to have to do this forever. Like, no, I live in the real, real world that says that all – the only thing that exists is this moment. Mm. <laughs> and even that yeah. freaks people out. You know, they're like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, all right, just do it for today, please. Most, <laughs> yeah. most people pay no attention to the actual moment. You yeah, know? man. It's all, yeah. it's all looking forward or looking backwards or both. That's right. You're absolutely right, man. That's a good place to pro- probably end off on today there, Scotty. I, we had a picturesque yeah. view. It sounds like the birds are chirping back there. Uh, you, you know, there are birds, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. Well, I think yeah. uh, I think that's probably good for today. You got anything else? No, nope, that should do it. Next awesome. time, I'll be back in my old my old digs next next week. So, okay, cool. Um, I'm Sean LaFlock. You can get me at Sean at CrossFitDiaryBeach dot com. Scott Hagmus, you can get me at Scott at CrossFitPortland dot com. Beautiful. All right, Scotty, enjoy the rest of your time away, and I'll see you next week. All right, we'll do. Later, dude.